the first session of the 2020 Ohio Beef Cattle Nutrition and Management School was hosted by the Ohio State University Extension Beef Team on January 29th in Woodville and repeated the following evening in Newark, Ohio. During that first session, Dr. Steve Boyles, Ohio State University Beef Specialist, discussed how the improper management and handling of fed cattle during sorting and transport can negatively impact the quality of the end product. This is Dr. Boyle's presentation as he described how the beef cattle industry can go about reducing the estimated $35 million in damage that occurs annually from bruising in beef animals. Um, why talk about bruising? Well, uh, there's a dollar value there. That is the estimated loss we're getting every year in the United States from bruising. The other reason for tonight is uh, Garth Ruff is going to talk about carcass value and grids next week, so perhaps a natural lead-in to that marketing aspect. Where are we losing this? This is from the latest National Beef Quality Audit, and this is based on going to many, many pet packing plants and thousands of carcasses. And they saw that 77% of the carcasses possessed some minor bruises. That's like a pound of trim. And then 21% of the carcasses had, say, a major carcass or a little major bruising. That's about 10 pounds of trim. The example that they used at the National Beef Quality Audit, there you see a loin cost of $2.88 on a load of 40 head of cattle. And 10 pounds of trim, it's to over $2,000. And we think this is a manageable thing that we can address. How we handle the animals, how we design facilities. So a manageable activity. I need to give credit to Dr. Lida Garcia as well. She is a meat scientist in our faculty and uh, appreciate her help with this presentation. Uh, just something out there, FYI, there's Transportation Quality Assurance. That's a voluntary program if you're interested in it. Uh, we have certified trainers among our OSU beef team, but you can go online if you want to uh, get certification. This is not the same thing as Beef Quality Assurance, uh, but if you're interested in that, you can co contact uh, your local uh, A&R agent or, uh, or you can go online. It, it doesn't cost anything. Well, a bruise can be defined as blood beneath the skin. Right there, it's due, due to injury. And there's enough force to cause a rupture of the blood vessels. And there has to be blood pressure. The blood, the heart working, you have to have blood pressure to get that bruise. And to see that bruise close to the surface, well, it has to be there. You can get deep bruises in that we can't see, but that is not pressure. Now, it's kind of tough to tell the uh, age of a bruise, but here's the general gist of this. When it initially occurs, it's going to be pink, red. Think about a bruise you've had. And then uh, blue, dark purple, pale green, then yellow brown. And we're really kind of most interested in these in our market cattle. They're going to probably be thinking about exiting the pens trucks, and also at the packing plant, where are our bruising occurring? So we, we want to investigate that. One of the things to think about, now I'm not sure those cattle, they've been in that pen for 150, 200 days. They've probably settled down. They're not fighting with each other a whole lot. So where's the next major move? That's going to be when they're exiting the pen to go to the packing plant. And this is a diagram of how, perhaps think about this as a method to cause those animals to exit the pen. Uh, my first go-to is to open up the gate, and I just kind of rock there, let the animals know I'm there. I may even circle around. I want to get their attention. Many times, if you just open the gate, they're going to start moving out of the pen. That's what we want them to do. But we don't want them to go in a rush out of that pen. 
I like to maybe move right here and those animals move past me in twos and threes versus fives and sixes. If they come around this pen or out of that gate, we're, we may well get some bruising. Also, that designs, now you see the gate is open here to the left, so we're apparently moving those cattle to the, to the right. I'm positioned myself there to make sure they make a wide turn. Market cattle, big cows, don't do short turns very well. So if they're in a wide turn, that can reduce some of that bruising hitting. You know, how, many, how many times have you hit, you know, say, a chair, table, that sort of thing, cutting it short? So reducing that turning. Also, if they only move past in twos and threes, you can see how they look. We're not so much about condition. They are what they are. But who has trouble moving? Locomotion scores. If there's a steer there that is having trouble walking, that means that's an animal that goes last on the truck. So those animals that have severe locomotion problems, they're still good enough to go to the packing plant, but we don't want to put those in the deep in the nose of the trailer. So those animals that locomotion is a challenge, they're the last on, that way they can be the first off. That doesn't always work, because they didn't see my slide, those market steers. Sometimes uh, you may have to go into the pen. Well, this shows, let's say if there's an animal standing in front of that opening, just that steer doesn't know what to do. So my first go-to is to probably push that animal down with the group because I want them to all leave together. Even then, I'm probably going to walk along this pen right here, and those animals will probably start moving by me. Once again, maybe only move a few at a time. We don't want a mad rush because they'll bru bruise each other on their side. I might have to eventually get back here to move those animals, but initial go-to if we can get those animals to move past us in a slow fashion. This is the design of a packing plant pen, uh, and it's a, called a herringbone design. I, we just talked about turning. This is designed to minimize turning, and this is not a corral for a ranch. This is meant one way. The trucks unload here, and they go into these holding pens. Notice at those angles, that's minimizing the turning that those animals have to do before they get to the, the kill floor. So they may come around here in a loop. There we're going kind of into that packing plant area. So a herringbone design. I put this slide in here about experience. Sometime, who's loading the animals at the truck? It could be you, or it could be the trucker. Some truckers prefer just to load the cattle themselves, but it can be a combination. But I put it up here, uh, some work uh, on, based on over 290,000 head of cattle, truckers that had six years of experience. The animals had less shrink when they got to the packing plant, fewer lame cattle, and lower death loss. Some ex experience is useful. And those, you know, we need to realize those animals, whether they're calves or market steers, it's like hauling water. You need to pull away slowly, make your turns gradual, and then stopping needs to be gradual as well. So driving experience can play an impact in how those animals are, uh, end up at the packing plant. Well, here's some data. Now we, we've got the cattle out of the pen, and we're going to go to the truck. So this is some work out of Kansas State where in those, in, over there in the High Plains, some of those big feedlots, you travel quite a distance from the pen to the truck. And this one, they're traveling a mile. Now the low stress handling was they walked the animals. They had a lead rider on a horse in front of those cattle leaving the pen so that they would walk. And all that blood chemistry there, no change. That's what we're looking for. Over here is they opened up the gate and let them go. Yeah, yeehaw. And, you know, they weren't chasing them. That's just the steers wanted to go. And they cleared, they, they got a mile in seven to ten minutes. I don't know what a freshman high school miler can do, but would seven minutes be a possible? 
If you can do it in four, the Olympic Committee wants you. So seven minutes, not bad, even 10. So, but what is that animal in that feedlot been doing for 150, 200 days? Eating. The equivalent of hanging back in a lazy boy lounger with a big old sandwich in front of a big TV and a super gulp. And they get out of that chair thinking, ha, the older I get, it's the easier I can overdo. Well, they overdo. Look at the blood chemistry, blood lactate. That's the byproduct of extreme exercise. Have you ever, well, I can't, I can remember, is, you know, working with weights and I get the burn in my bicep, lactic acid, byproduct of that. So that's elevated, elevated heart rate, rectal temperature up, blood pH decrease. Those are all bad things. So the rule is for market cattle, they should never run. They should never jog. They should always walk out of the pen, to the truck, into the packing plant. Running is not a good thing. Also might notice, I have stuff here in blue. You know, we're not marked selling cattle every day in our feed yards here in Ohio. So it's, you know, intermittent thing. But what we remember, need to remember to do, slow down the cattle, but we need to slow down. We're used to doing, I've got to do this today, I've got to do this today, I've got to do this. And these are daily activities. We need to pull the reins in on ourselves or the people working for us and say, no, this is important. We're going to slow down now. We're going to load these cattle. Then we'll get back to our regular daily activities. So we have to commit to it as well. This is just showing a picture. Uh, this is a feed yard. And they, they walk the cattle to the packing plant. And so it's maybe over a mile. Anyway, in this picture, there's a person behind the cattle. They have a great big pop bottle that has some rocks in it, and they're just slapping it against their leg. And then there's another person right here. That's going to slow down these cattle, cause them to walk. Yet he's, you know, he's pushing along, and there's actually a person in front of these animals, and they're walking them to the packing plant. And that's just it. And there's the holding pens uh, where they're going to be held until they go into uh, the packing plant. Dark cutters. That's the result of pre-harvest stress. And we have a depletion of what's called muscle glycogen. That's an energy storage uh, in the muscles. It results in an elevated pH and the color, the color. Remember those steers that ran seven to ten you know, minutes in a mile? Increased incidence. Yes, sir. Yes, we, we get that, that darker color. And well, and muscle exertion. Yeah, depletion of glycogen. Bright cherry red, that means oxygen is in the muscle. Now we've kind of depleted it because the oxygen has been used for exercise. Well, it, it, it's going up now. I mentioned probably lactic acid in the blood, but this is in the muscle. Yeah. The question is, how long does it come back? If we've got stressed animals, how long does it take them for that glycogen to settle back down? Or it's probably several days for let them... You know, they, what, if, what if animal goes through sleet and rain? Well, we don't want to immediately slaughter those animals. Maybe the next day, but not today. So, so. If you've ever, wow, I'm 63. I need a day to recover from overdoing it. <laughs> so handling can be a problem. We just kind of talked about that. Disposition can be an issue. How many of you have a relative that's crazy? Thank you. The rest of you are liars. Uh, uh, that's not a majority, hopefully. But, yeah, it can be genetics, uh, somewhat related there. And weather, I just mentioned, you know, moving cattle in sleet and wet, that's going to cause them to shiver. And that is also depletion of energy in the muscle. So we can get that dark color. 
Well, so kind of leading up along with that, extreme weather, cold weather especially, um, mixing different pens of cattle prior to harvest. Uh, I can think of this with the county fair. Somebody, buy, local car dealer buys a steer, local appliance buys a steer, whoever, and they put them together the night before at the local packing plant. What are those steers doing that night before? They're fighting. They're not thinking about life. They're reestablishing the hierarchy. That takes energy. So we can get in some dark cutters. We'll show. Pardon? That can be, yeah. And especially if they're mixed together or, yeah, that, that's inner exertion. Buller, what we call buller steers, those are actually the ones that get mounted and mounted and mounted. Yeah, they need to be pulled because they're, they're getting abused, but also a lot of energy expenditure by them. Uh, so that causes stress. Crowding can cause stress. I just mentioned uh, genetics. It's just interesting. In genetics, disposition, in many cases, it's more highly heritable than reproductive traits. So you can make an impact. Uh, but loud noises when we're handling. We don't need to be yelling. Well, increased pH in dark uh, cutters. That's, well, the, the color's not good, but there's another problem. That muscle that has elevated pH, it reduces its shelf life. Uh, the bacteria like that. They, that. If the muscle's a little bit on the acid side, that keeps the bacteria away. When it gets into that dark area, we have some elevated pH. It's a better environment for microbes, so we can't keep that meat out. It's already not very attractive, but now maybe not even we can't even keep it on the shelf very long. Moving aids, uh, certainly consider using them, such as flags, plastic paddles, bottle that has some rocks in it. That's fine. The only thing I'm putting out here is the, the electric prod shouldn't necessarily be your primary tool to move animals. And we've got some work to do there. Uh, a number of people think that that prod is an extension of their arm, and that can be an issue. And I have to admit myself, I can't use flags, plastic paddles, stick with plastic ribbons. I can't use any of those. I have a genetic defect. If you give me something like that, I am likely to hit the animal. But I realize it. So whenever I work cattle, this is all I use. So if I get mad at them, I don't do any damage. I just bring that up. You need to look at yourself or the people that work for you. Do they have my genetic defect? If they do, you need to correct it or remove whatever uh, and regulate them to something like this. But back to the, I don't want to say we can't use the electric prod. It's better than really aggressively yanking the tail. You know, that tail twist. <clears throat> put it in 180 degree, that's not necessarily an answer either. Yeah, a short shot, get that animal moving, great. But it can impact meat quality. This is some work out of England. Uh, uh, goating, electric goating on cattle 15 minutes prior to slaughter. Six to eight prods prior to that animal meat and its maker. Water and holding capacity went down. So that's reducing carcass quality just by that prod being overused. So we may have some work to do with ourselves, maybe our truckers. I just bring this up. This is not necessarily related to packing, but there's a, uh, a feed yard assessment tool. You can download this for free. If you want to evaluate your feed yard, your cow-calf operation, your stalker operation, actually all of them are pretty much based on this feed yard assessment, but it's about welfare. And Texas Cattle Feeder uses this. They help develop it. So twice a year out in those big yards, there's somebody sitting there watching them work cattle. And let's say you have 100 head and you apply electric prod to 11 of those animals. You fail. So I, 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 we don't have a you know, a, a, 
a list for packing plants, but we do have one for feedlots and how we handle those animals in a feed yard. And there you can see some other things that we evaluate in those animals or how we're handling those cattle. Well, one of the things we need to think about is maybe providing light to those animals. A lot of times we're loading trucks in the dark. So think about having a lamp, some sort of light, so they can see into that trailer and shine it forward so they can see where they're going, not worried about our shoes. This is some uh, research with swine, same thing. So trying to get into a dark entrance, they had to apply 38% of the time an electric prod versus just providing some light to get in, 4%. So a little bit of light does a lot of things. Kind of back to the National Beef Quality Audit. Here's carcasses without bruises, past, present. So in the past, we had 65% without any bruises. We improved in 2011, and we were up to 77%. Now in this latest beef quality audit, we're down to 61% without, without bruises. Now between there and here, we had a drought. I knew we had people that spoke English in here. Uh, we had, so we had a really decrease in the number of our animals. And what did we do? We made the cattle we had bigger. So that could be partly that. I'm not sure we're hitting animals more. They, they've gotten bigger on us uh, over time. Well, here's a picture of a bruise. That will have to be cut out. We do not sell bruised meat. It has blood in it, clots. Ooh. No, they don't mix it with a hamburger. Well, there's a steer that lost money, and I don't care how you fed it. All that bruising over the loin, a lost cause, a lost cause. That's somebody that shouldn't be working with animals. That's a welfare issue, but also it's a money issue. But uh, I, I bring up maybe less, I'm not sure this is caused by a slam gate. I've done that, uh, maybe accidentally or got in a hurry, and I slammed a gate against a calf or or cow, something like that. Try to avoid that. Uh, this spring, walk through your handling facilities, especially if they're made out of wood, to see if those nails have, you know, moved in and out. So hammer those back in. Uh, fencing, slippery flooring. I was saying today out at the cow calf workshop around that squeeze chute. After about the fifth or sixth animal through there with, say, some heifers. They're going to maybe start to slip on you. Their back feet come out from after you release them. I always like to have a bucket of sand. If it's dirt, fine, something to throw down there right in front where they're, they're exiting so they don't slip. We certainly don't want these market cattle to slip as well. Well, here's just another example. There's the left, the bruise, and there's the bruise cut out. So a lot of pounds of beef lost. This is something, this is not a bruise, this is what's called a callus. This is severe trauma early in life. This didn't, I don't think, this didn't happen at the feed yard. This could have been the feeder calf got slammed by a cow or a bull, maybe, whatever. That's severe trauma. That's not fat, that's connective tissue. When the packing plant sees this, they just say, pitch it. It's not worth it. The, the, the minutes required to trim out just to get this little piece, they just, just move on. So that's severe trauma early in life. So cow-calf producers, we need to be have a vigil as well. Well, this is a study looking at over 4,000 head of cattle moving into a plant. And over the time period, there was uh, about 53% of them that had a bruise. Uh, minor was about 5 centimeters. That's about 5 centimeters. Uh, 5 to 15, there's about 15 centimeters, and then uh, greater than that. And there you see the percentage of bruise size. 63% uh, were on the dorsal midline. That's here right on the back. 
and left, right side, not a big difference. Now, we often say we don't want, you know, horned cattle. I, I'll stand by that in, in a trailer because I expect increased bruising. In this particular study, they didn't find a uh, relationship between horned and polled. A different study, but similar sort of work. Uh, this is total trim, but I'll be honest, I'm more interested here on the, this diagram on the right. This is bruising count by location in plants. The darker the color, that's where the bruises are. So over the back, over that rump, round area, uh, more bruising there. Mm-hmm. No. Uh, uh, we're going to talk about the truck as another possibility, but I don't want to discount the packing plant, okay? Uh, all those things are on us as cattle feeders, but there's some other places that uh, we need to be vigilant of. Well, here's a typical pot trailer. So you've got, there's the feeder calves up there, and then if you've got market animals, uh, you don't use the dog and you don't use this upper uh, top nose, and you load this, uh, these animals in here. And so you can get about 15 head in the, in the pot, or the bottom of one of those pots. And so this is what that animal sees. What, they may have seen this twice, when they were a feeder calf, uh, getting loaded and heading to a feed yard, and then they're heading out of the feed yard. They see this picture. Keep in mind that 62% dorsal midline brood. So that's about 56 inches that they see. What about tall cattle? <clears throat> if you're a tall animal, if I've got a set of Holstein steers and say some Hereford Angus steers, maybe the Hereford Angus go into the, the bottom of this, this trailer and I put the, the Holsteins on that main floor. So height could be it. But also their behavior. This is a, a trucker owned this trailer, and I talked to him about it. And he said when he originally bought it, the cleats went out to here. And he noticed what those cattle were doing when they came down the steps and they saw the cleats. They didn't recognize them. They were trying to jump to get over the cleats. So he cleated the whole thing, and that reduced some of the jumping. So animal behavior plays a part in this. In fact, what he likes to do is put bedding down the middle of the trailer. He doesn't spread it in the entire bottom of the trailers. They spread it out themselves. They get themselves situated in there, moving around, trying to fix out where they're at. Uh, they spread out that bedding. But they do see something that they recognize. They do see something they recognize. And I remember you saying today, you don't want a completely clean trailer. Yeah, I'd probably leave a little dirt on those steps myself. Uh, so it looks a little more natural. Now, what some operators are doing is they're making uh, the trailers taller or dropping the floor four inches. Okay, trying to reduce that problem. But the regular trailer is not going to go away overnight. That is an $85,000 pop can. And a pop can is a magnificent thing. And they're not going to spend the money on all those. They're going to wear them out before they replace the ones that we have. Well, in one study was worked, low stocking rate can cause bruising as well. There's a lot of room for those animals to move around probably to have ideal the, the suggested stocking rate for the trailer. But trying to crowd them up, that's not necessarily good either. So that can have, cause some bruising as well. Well, 
the statement, cattle rarely change position, position while the trailer is in motion. They typically find where they're at and they probably stick. This is, I'll give you a chance to read that. This is a cattle hauler out of Ohio. And this is an email that he sent me. That's the funny part, and it's a serious part as well. But I like the part where he said, I start talking to the owner about soccer, this and that. He doesn't immediately get in the truck when the truck's loaded. Those animals are still shuffling around, figuring things out in those different compartments. If you've ever been on an airplane, they don't pull away from the gate until everybody sat down. Well. That's kind of the same logic there. So let those animals kind of get halfway settled before you start uh, moving on the trip. And that, that is a serious concern that, you know, that if you arrive at the packing plant and you've got a dead, there can be some problems. Okay. Well, when we look where, where cattle are held, the majority are in those uh, middle compartments, about 60%. And where are the bruising? Well. 45 in here up in the nose, those animals have to go up steps, go across the main floor, normally down a step into the nose. Uh, we just looked at the, the, the steps going down into the belly here. And this one has my head scratching. I just mentioned the doghouse. It is little, little, little. They'll put a few, maybe two or three feeder calves in there. It's that small. Yet there's bruising up there. Are they putting a market steer in the doghouse? And I'm just, wow. That animal is almost like a garage. I just, it goes in there. I can't imagine turning around. Anyway, that's, that, that was the study. Okay. One of the things, think about, we've got those animals. We've, tra we've traveled. Now we're going to unload them. Uh, I work with some packing plants and look for slipping. Now remember that slipping? You don't, you don't want that. Remember there was a lot of bruises on the rump and round? Is that caused by them coming off the truck, going on it? And maybe the simple thing is, if they're having to come down some sort of ramp, make it more gradual uh, to reduce that problem. But think about that at the other end. If we're loading animals and we've got too steep of a ramp and they're you know, falling down on their front knees, uh, we may need to make adjustments to that design. OK, we, we've arrived at the packing plant. The truck is unloaded. Here's the animals standing overnight. It could be during the day, but anyway, this is overnight. The one on the left is understocked. That's okay from an animal welfare standpoint. The animals can move around. They can lay down. The, uh, the one at capacity there, still, the animals can move around. They can lay down. Over capacity. Where are they going to lay down? That's a stress. I do some uh, dairy cow welfare assessments, and interesting looking at studies. You've got a dairy cow that's hungry and a dairy cow that's tired and wants to lay down. They'll go lay down. Wow. And they're not eating. That's going to affect milk production. Well, those animals are probably in stress and they're standing overnight. We've already looked at some of that blood chemistry work. The result of that, the work was for overnight situations, there are standards on how many animals should be in those, in those pens. If you go to a packing plant and you look over the pen, see what you see. Now, there's no specifications for cattle that aren't kept overnight. If they arrive 8 in the morning, they're going to be slaughtered at 3, whatever. But overnight, there are some specifications. Well... <clears throat> We've moved away from the feed yard. We're at the packing plant, but we're not done yet. This, you know, everything's related. A bruise can form before stunning. A bruise can occur after stunning. We have stunned that animal. We still have blood pressure. We've not bled the animal. We still have blood pressure. And if 
that time period between stunning and sticking is extended, we can have things happen such as bruising because we do have blood pressure. Uh, this is a packing plant I was working at. And so the animals go in here, go in here, and into, uh, into the harvest floor. And these are the backstops. These backstops would hold rhino. They are substantial. And I have to give credit here to Dr. Lida Garcia. I was working on the outside. She was working on the inside. And this is what she saw. Majority of the carcasses were coming through. And there was, uh, Dave, a bruise there. We just, you mentioned the, the feed yard truck. Ah, this is the packing plant. These truck, that same picture. These animals walked from a feed yard to the packing plant. And see, it's red. And remember that early slide I had of different colors of bruises? That's, that bruise is not very old. 